Welcome back. My chair is out of place. I'm a few minutes late. Sorry, I'm uh, late there. Hello again, everybody. It is Wednesday. It is 10 a.m. here on the West Coast. That means we're streaming on Twitch. Thanks for joining. Much appreciated as always. Let's get the picture where we want it to be. There we go. I'm going to send out the little uh, notice on Twitter so that folks who uh, want to join can join. Today's a little bit of a odd day for the old uh, Twitch stream because, you know, the, the, the reality is that a lot of the folks who... Uh, might watch the stream are busy right now are busy at the uh wireless lan professionals conference gonna post the tweet right now i am live on twitch join um, so yeah, a lot of folks are at, uh, the WLPC or Wireless LAN Professionals Conference now. Um, if, if you've never, uh, been to the WPC, uh, WLPC, uh, the Wireless LAN Professionals Conference, um, I, I, I find it's, uh, it's a great time. Um, for, for me personally, a lot of it tends to be kind of, uh, uh, getting in touch with uh, old friends, with uh, with folks who uh, I know but don't get a chance to see all that often. So it's almost a little bit of a reunion vibe for me personally. Um, but there, there's also it, it's also a chance to kind of stay up to date, to learn a little bit about uh, the way people are looking at Wi-Fi and and the way people are approaching wireless LAN deployments and tools and troubleshooting and all that other type of stuff. Um, for folks that may be a little bit newer to the game, it can be a great educational experience as well. You may learn a lot of stuff there. There's definitely been some WLPC presentations where I've learned a lot. There, there's no doubt about it. Uh, one that especially sticks out to me is one from, uh, the very first WLPC. I think it was the first, maybe the first or the second, uh, that, uh, Jerome Henri, uh, he's French. So, so you spell it like Henry, uh, H-E-N-R-Y, Jer Jerome Henri did. Um, and, uh, it was, it was just all about, uh, kind of Wi-Fi device behavior as he, as it relates to roaming, as it relates to, uh, devices kind of moving from wireless access point to wireless access point. Um, I found it to be, uh, really informative really uh useful and um and yeah i um you know i thought that was a uh, a great presentation so yeah so so definitely lots of uh um you know good stuff happens at the wlpc um to be honest with you sorry i'm farfling with my uh computer here having a little uh issue getting one of the things up that i want to have up for today's stream um oops now i'm messing with the uh get in there usb there we go sorry okay uh yeah you know it so uh so so yeah definitely been some uh presentations at least uh for me that have been very very useful very informative um I would say uh, for most people, that's the case. You learn stuff. You get to catch up with people. You get to, you know, talk about kind of what some of the trends are and and things that are going to happen. There's there's live podcasts that happen. Definitely um, a share of uh, you know imbibing that also happens. Um, definitely. Uh, so so yeah, it's uh, it's a good time. Going to finish out the old tweet here. Talking about channel access arbitration today um so yeah you know um and yeah it, it uh you know it pains me uh, not to be there schedule just didn't work out this year for me um but uh but yeah i'm sure it'll be a good time i need to probably try to put a little bit of a higher priority on that stuff um for the uh and let me post a little chat message just to make sure that that is working okay over here. 
Sorry, I uh, am disorganized at the start as usual. Ah, it's not working, so that is a good thing to know. So yeah, a little bit uh, disorganized as often happens, but uh, I think I'm now getting in. Okay, looks like I'm in now. Let's do the little hello. Okay, there we go. So yeah. All right, I see the hello. That is good news. Um, yeah, I'm still, uh, man, it's it's kind of pathetic because it's been uh, probably five months, I think over five months, like five and a half months now that I've been doing Twitch streams. And I still haven't totally learned Twitch, haven't gotten the hang of uh, being organized before starting my weekly stream either. Um, but uh, there's always time. That's that's the great thing is life is long, as I like to say. I'm not a big life is short believer. Um, you don't want to be too impatient with things, in my in my view. So it's still good to you know do do things expeditiously. Don't get me wrong, but I am a big believer that life is long. Uh, and those of you that follow the stream know I've uh, spilt my coffee the last two weeks, so today I'm going with tea. Here's a man. These things are so good if you're a tea drinker, just the little single pot thing that uh, put some tea leaves in and uh, then you can make yourself a single pot of tea. Life changer. No more tea bags for me. Cleanup's not as easy as with tea bags. So that's uh, that's that much is clear. And then for a really long time, my watchers, look, it is WLPC, one of my favorite Wi-Fi folks, uh, UC. Uh, UC Kavenemy, I believe is how you pronounce it. If you watch this, UC, uh, my deep apologies if I just butchered your uh, name. UC's Finnish, and, uh, you know, as a red-blooded American, it's our right to mispronunciate every name possible. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so UC uh, uh, at a WLPC, I think it was actually two years ago, if I remember correctly, Gave me this delicious uh, Finnish vodka. Maybe you can see the name of it there. I know the light is a little bit odd here, but look at that stuff. Excellent. So I got got to got to celebrate. Even though I can't be there, got to celebrate the start of WLPC by taking a shot at some point here during the stream, and uh, not not taking a huge shot this uh, this early in the morning. Yeah, the the issue with that. Stuff. So what it is is it's licorice vodka. Man, uh, and look, I'm a huge licorice fan. That's that's the thing. So for me, it's perfect. But I think you see, look, the the history there. For those of you that may not be as aware of it, is you see, is is the guy that kind of brought Ekahau into the in into being um, when it comes to uh, Wi-Fi. You know, I I don't want to go into too much of a history lesson. I'm looking at the clock. It says uh 10 11 right now um so uh what the heck is going on here actually let's see let's see but yeah so uh, uh looking at the clock here it's uh is that uh working right now okay yeah yeah it looks like it is sorry thought i saw something that was indicating an issue of some type um, but yeah, so, uh, so, so I'm looking at the clock, it's, it's 10, 12 now, so I'll keep the story to three minutes by, uh, by 10, 15, I'll get back to kind of what I was talking about. But, uh, so if, if you've been around Wi-Fi for a long time, if you go back, um, right around 15 years, maybe a little bit less, let's say 14 years, the, um, the sort of intellectuals, or at least many of the intellectuals, in the Wi-Fi world, we're um, starting to embrace the idea of eliminating site surveys. Um, the idea, I remember it was especially promoted strongly by Aruba Networks. There were definitely some other folks uh, who were into it as well. The idea was that Wi-Fi would be best done with what you might call a grid install. Uh, let, me, let me try to diagram this out so that I can... Uh, um, you know, sort of uh, uh, help you understand what I mean by a grid install, just in case it's not entirely clear. But yeah, the idea is that Wi-Fi would be done via grid install, 
And what that essentially meant was you just place wireless access points every so many feet or every so many meters uh, around a given deployment area. And then you would let the wireless LAN controller or whatever entity it is that's managing your Wi-Fi network, you would let that wireless LAN controller handle all radio frequency settings. And because of the fact that the controller would be able to intelligently um, make an access point broadcast with a higher signal or a lower signal, m allow the access points to kind of change channels. Uh, ultimately, the result of this grid install would be that y you, you would have to spend very, very little time and energy, virtually no time and energy on doing any kind of traditional site survey, um, but you would still get a, a sort of a, a high quality deployment happening. Um, I don't know if it's showing up on screen the way I am currently intending it to. I should have my whiteboard up there, but it looks like the old whiteboard is currently not up. Let's see what is happening here. Um, oh man, definitely not good if I can't get the whiteboard up. That'll kind of nullify basically most of what I was planning to do. <laughs> um, and yeah, it looks like, darn it, it looks like the whiteboard is not coming up at the moment. So that is a major bummer. Let's see, let's see. Oh, okay, that's why it's not coming up. Give me just a moment. It's the same weird issue I was seeing earlier on that kind of caused me to pause when it when I said 10, 11 a.m. Um, okay, now you should be seeing the whiteboard, I hope. There we go, there we go. Okay, sorry about that, everybody. So yeah, so with the grid install, what I mean by that is, you know, I have my office space here and I just install wireless access points X amount of distance away from one another. So this distance away from one another, that's what I mean by the grid install. And then the um, the uh, infrastructure, the wireless LAN controller kind of decides, well, with this access point here, I'm having to connect to some clients that are further away. So I'll use a higher power and for this other access point, I'll use a lower power. And for one of these access points, I'll be on channel number 36. And for this other one, I'll be on channel 149. And so my access points won't have any kind of interference or anything like that. Uh, so that that was that was kind of uh, uh, the, the line of thinking from some folks, not, not necessarily from everyone, but definitely from a fair number of influential uh, folks within the wireless LAN industry. Again, especially promoted by Aruba, to be, to be perfectly frank about it. Uh, if you go back to the mid to latter part of the double O's of last decade. Uh, th then all of a sudden we got a lot, not all of a sudden, but eventually we kind of realized we had a lot of subpar wireless LAN installs out there. And so the idea was, well, you know, what we really need is better Wi-Fi design. You know, rather than just doing this grid thing, uh, you know, we'll we'll kind of figure out that, you know, maybe if we have some rooms over here and maybe if we have a hallway uh, going down through part of our, uh, for our, you know, through an office area or whatever it may be, you know, maybe in some cases we're going to have access points a little bit further apart. In other cases where there's walls or where there's higher densities of people, we'll have access points closer together. And so, so the idea of this sort of hot couture design, this bespoke design for wireless uh, started to become the prevailing theory. And so the idea was, well, you know, you, you, you want to have software that's going to help you with this. Uh, and the, the software that kind of emerged as, as the number one software to do this is uh, Ekahau, as many of you have probably heard of or are aware of. And Ekahau absolutely, you know, killed it, absolutely took over. It, uh, I mean, I remember uh, it was probably about two years ago at WLPC, um, UC was on stage. UC was kind of the, 
the uh, head marketing and kind of promotional person for Eka. How he also kind of helped with the direction of how the software was going to go a little, a little bit. Um, yeah, UC was on stage and he asked for a show of hands, like who here uses Ekahau? And I think the whole room of however many people it was, I think maybe 300 plus people raised their hand. There, there was literally me and one other person who didn't raise our hand when asked who uses Ekahau. Um, I, I think things have cooled off a little bit since then. Ekahau now, I think, is is kind of looked at a little bit more as primarily an integrator's tool, not not so much a tool that you necessarily need uh, if you're the engineer of a network or something like that. But uh, it, it still is a huge tool. But the the bottom line was, you know, and, and, and that uh, hand raising thing was an example of it that, uh, you know, may, maybe I had some conflicts here or there with UC. And so as a joke, a couple years ago, he's like, here, I'm going to give you this gift from Finland of this horrible vodka that is popular with some people in Finland, but basically that most right upstanding uh, Helsinkiites really do not like. And uh, so, so he gave me that. But little did UC know that I'm a humongous fan of licorice. You know, you can see the back here. It even says, hopefully you can see that there, salty licorice vodka. And uh, so, yeah, so I, I like the taste of the stuff. It's, uh, it's, it's pretty darn good, in my opinion. So, yeah, I went past, of course, th those of you that have watched the stream before know that I always go long on whatever I'm doing, unfortunately. Uh, so, so I went a little bit past kind of where I wanted to uh, go there. Whoops, that's the wrong page. That's not what I wanted. There we go. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, so that's, that's a little background. Let's see how the T is. Yeah, the tea's getting there. Need the tea to uh, cool down a little bit. So might as well start off with the shot. Got my little Biloxi Shuckers uh, shot glass here. Hopefully you can see that. Biloxi Shuckers. I don't know if they still are, but at the time I was uh, working in Biloxi for a very short time. Uh, I think it was a week or maybe a couple weeks. Um, in uh, Biloxi, Mississippi. It's down on the Gulf Coast, the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, in the southern part of the United States, for those that may not be familiar with U.S. geography. Uh, the uh, Biloxi Shuckers are a baseball team. They're the sort of third division team uh, in the Milwaukee Brewers organization. I'm originally, I grew up in Milwaukee, so I'm a big Milwaukee Brewers fan. And so I couldn't pass up the chance while in Biloxi to get a Biloxi Shuckers uh, shot glass here. So yeah, there we go. A little licorice relatively early in the day here in the United States. I, yeah, you know, 6 p.m. in the UK, 8 p.m. in uh, Helsinki. So for 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 you folks, at least those of you that are non-teetotalers, um, you know, this is perfectly normal time to, uh, to have a shot of Finnish li salty licorice vodka. I actually need to talk to UC and see where I can get more of that stuff. It's pretty good. I mean, look, you know, it's one bottle and it's taken me two years to drink it. So maybe it, maybe it's not the best stuff in the world. But yeah, Captain Hardship, I definitely uh, recommend checking it out there. Okay, let's let's get on to what I what I actually want to talk about today. You know, where where this kind of initiated from. Oh man, I know for weeks I've been saying I got a blog post. I need to post a blog post, etc. Um, but yeah, you know, I, uh, what, what this initiated from is th the blog post that I'm working on. And <laughs> when I do post it, it's going to be totally embarrassing that this thing took me weeks. It's, it's purely out of just inattentiveness. It's just, you, you know, it's not like some long, complicated, hugely researched blog post. It's a blog post that should basically take one day. Um, but I just haven't gone back to it and kind of made the final edits after I, uh, wrote the, wrote the rough draft of it. Uh, but yeah, so the idea was, you know, I, I want to write this blog post about uh, 802.11ax clients, about Wi-Fi 6 clients, because there there's definitely some awareness of uh, 802.11ax uh, um, clients and, and sort of potential issues therein. Let me see if I can find a recent blog that I was reading about it so I can give you all the link. Uh, Lee Badman wrote it. Uh, Lee Badman 
Wi-Fi 6 clients. I'm just doing a quick Google search here to see if I can find you. The uh, most recent one that I uh, that I saw here. Don't know if this is uh, CBRS. That's not the one. Yeah, I'm not. Uh, darn it, darn it, darn it. It wasn't on his blog. It was in a uh, magazine of some type here. Differences. Standard is ratified. Yeah, the point is, um, gosh darn it all, I uh, lost track of where the blog was. But the point, uh, the point there is that... Um, uh, he wrote a blog, Lee Badman did. Lee Badman is uh, on Twitter as Wired Not. Let me uh, post his uh, Twitter handle here. Those of you that are on Twitter, I encourage you to follow him. Um, he, uh, he posted an article somewhere, and I am uh, completely forgetting exactly which uh, outlet it was, uh, talking about how there is, is not sort of a universal adoption of uh, Wi-Fi 6 among client devices, uh, that there are definitely a lot of 802.11, so 802.11ax is Wi-Fi 6, just to kind of make that clear, 802.11ax equals Wi-Fi 6. So uh, Wi-Fi 6 is sort of the industry certification for it. It's, it's, it's kind of a marketing term, so to speak. Um, something to to make uh, um, to, to make things a little bit uh, easier for folks who aren't super into Wi-Fi, who don't want to deal with kind of super complicated or esoteric terms. There we go. I finally found the uh, blog that he did. Manage your Wi-Fi 6 expectations. So I read this blog. Those of you that are following along live, I encourage you to to kind of check it out there here for those of you that may be watching this as a recording let me uh post this on the old um on the old whiteboard give me just a minute here to get that posted whoops that is too big there we go okay so this is the uh Sorry, I'm uh, having a little bit of an issue here. It's really sad that I uh, don't know this stuff that well in terms of uh, really anything technology related. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Now, now, uh, now I finally figured it out. <laughs> Sad. Okay. So yeah, so those of you that aren't watching live, here's the, uh, here's the blog post there. If you want to check out, uh, Lee Badman's blog and let me put up his, uh, Twitter handle. Uh, his Twitter handle is at Wired Not. You can see the name there, Lee Badman. I know he works in uh, higher education. I know he's done a lot of writing for various networking publications. All around nice guy from what I've seen at the um, conferences when I've gotten a chance to meet him and chat with him a little bit. So the point is, uh, if, you, if you take a look at this blog here, and I'm sure if you do a Google search on manage your Wi-Fi 6 expectations, you'll be able to find the blog. Um, if you take a look at the blog, Lee talks about a, a salient point, at least in my opinion, that there, there are definitely a lot of new wireless client devices that are coming out that are not supporting Wi-Fi 6. And that's, that's a little bit troubling. Like, for example, the, the latest iteration of the MacBook from Apple does not support Wi-Fi 6. And... and you know that to me at least that was a little bit surprising because when Apple came out with their most recent iPhones, they do support uh, Wi-Fi six, and so at least kind of my thought there was okay, good. You know that means that 
We're gonna be getting Wi-Fi 6 support in Apple devices from here on out now that the newest iPhones are supporting Wi-Fi 6. But then whatever it was, you know, three, four months later when the new version of MacBooks and MacBook, uh, MacBook Airs and MacBook Pros were announced, uh, there was no Wi-Fi 6, no, no Wi-Fi 6 to be found. And look, you know, in some ways that dovetails with what I've talked about on the stream before as it relates to OFDMA. Um, you, you may remember from earlier streams, I've said that OFDMA is, is kind of the key Wi-Fi 6 technology. Uh, OFDMA is this technology that allows multiple Wi-Fi client devices to kind of share a channel at the same time. They can, they can all receive data from the access point at once, or they can all send data to the access point at once with this OFDMA technology. And OFDMA, I ought to bring up, whoops, ought to bring up the old uh, whiteboard here real quickly just to write down a couple of notes on OFDMA that, again, have been covered uh, in previous streams. But, you know, for those of you that, that may not tune in every week, uh, just mention it here. You know, so Wi-Fi 6 is 802.11ax. And uh, kind of the signature technology of Wi-Fi 6 is this OFDMA. And essentially what the OFDMA does is it kind of splits the channel so that multiple clients can communicate at once. Communicate at once. So simultaneously, multiple clients can either be transmitting or receiving with a wireless access point uh, if OFDMA is supported. Um, but the the you know sort sort of uh, you know the issue is that that I thought Lee did a good job of covering is that there are a lot of new clients that are not supporting OFDMA uh, that that are not supporting Wi-Fi six at all. In fact, like I said, the MacBooks, uh, some lower end smartphones as well. But, you know, like when I saw the news that uh, that the MacBooks were not supporting OFDMA, you know, kind of my initial reaction is, well, okay, you know, OFDMA is from the cellular world. And so maybe Apple's, it, you know, sort of thought is, well, Wi-Fi 6, this technology that's primarily OFDMA, that's going to be important for devices that are cellular or, or similar to cellular devices, you know, devices that are moving around, devices that typically don't have the same bandwidth requirements as laptop and desktop computers, you know, lower bandwidth requirements and such. Give me a tea break here. And, and, and so maybe Apple thought, well, you know, OFDMA is more of a cellular technology, MacBook Pros, MacBook Airs, these are laptops, so these don't de don't necessarily need OFDMA. So that might be part of what's happening with you know what what Lee wrote about uh, uh, what he wrote about uh, Wi-Fi six not being ad adopted widely in client devices. You know what? Again, look like if 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 you look at like Samsung or Apple, their high end smartphones do support Wi-Fi six. Um, so I, I don't want to make it seem like there's some major crisis where nothing's supporting Wi-Fi 6. Um, Lee, I think, wrote that uh, there's some high-end Dell laptops that do support Wi-Fi 6. So there, there is definitely Wi-Fi 6 support out there, but there are some things that don't. And like I said, at least for me, the, the Apple laptops were a big... I, I, I was just surprised to see it. I was really expecting that the new generation of Apple laptops would support OFDMA, would support Wi-Fi 6. Um, but then the the thing that I'm, go, you, you know, that the, the blog I'm doing is um, is about, is a little bit different from that. It's kind of tangential that it's the fact that even if you have a Wi-Fi 6 client, it may not actually use OFDMA. So it's, it's like a tricky thing. The, the way that it works is, OFDMA is mandatory within 802.11ax. A device must support OFDMA. It must be able to use OFDMA for the device to be 802.11ax, for the device to be Wi-Fi 6 certified. It is mandatory 
in terms of support. However, it is optional in terms of use. And that's kind of the big thing that, uh, that, that I noticed with the standard, that I've noticed in people who have talked about and written about Wi-Fi 6 devices, uh, that even if you have a Wi-Fi 6 smartphone, even if you have an iPhone 11 or 11 Pro or whatever, or you have the Samsung you know, Galaxy S20 or you know, whatever newer, higher-end models of phones you might have, or one of the higher-end Dell laptops that's Wi-Fi 6, even if you have one of those things, sort of in the background, your phone or, or your laptop or whatever device it is may be sort of opting out of Wi-Fi 6, maybe opting out of OFDMA and may be going back to the old technology, the technology that we had with uh, Wi-Fi 4 and Wi-Fi 5, maybe going back to OFDM. And I don't want to get too far down the rabbit hole. Technically, Wi-Fi 2 and 3 also use OFDM, but they use what I like to call old OFDM. So Wi-Fi 2, that's 802.11a. Wi-Fi 3, that's 802.11g. Wi-Fi 4, that's 802.11, whoops, n. Wi-Fi 5, that's 802.11ac. Uh... Wi-Fi 4 and 5 use a slightly different type of OFDM that has all different speeds, all different data rates compared to the OFDM version that was used in 802.11a and g. Uh, essentially, the, the long and the short of it is, when it comes to data communication, when it comes to data frames... A Wi-Fi 4 or 5 device will never use Wi-Fi 2 or 3 speeds. 2 or 3 speeds, you know, uh, data rates. If you see that you have a Wi-Fi 4 or Wi-Fi 5 device on your network, and if you have confirmed that the Wi-Fi 4 or Wi-Fi 5 device, the, the, the 802.11n or 802.11ac device, is using old OFDM speeds. If it's using the speeds that are associated with Wi-Fi 2 and 3, uh, those speeds are 6, 9, 12, 18, 24, 36, 48, and 54 megabits per second. So if you know... For a fact, if you have it confirmed that a Wi-Fi 4 or 5 device, meaning an N or an AC device, is using 6, 9, 12, 18, 24, 36, you know, all those speeds that I just wrote there, megabits per second, then that means that you have a config issue. Somewhere in the configuration of your infrastructure, of your access points, you know, your wireless controller, your wireless management software, whatever it is, somewhere in the configuration there, there's a mistake. Somewhere in that configuration, you have it set up to allow sort of faster devices to use speeds that are slower than they ever should be using. So, um, and look, to be clear on this, I don't mean that every speed between 6 and 54 is the sign of a problem. For example... Uh, there's a 13 megabit per second speed that's perfectly fine. If you're 802.11n or AC or even AX, even Wi-Fi 6, if your N or AC or AX devices are using 13 megabits per second, that's fine. They're, that's not the sign of a configuration problem necessarily. Um, but if it's if it's those other ones, then, uh, uh, then yeah. Yeah, uh, you, you know... German, yeah, at least that's what the Wi-Fi Alliance has done, is they've kind of retrofitted 1, 2, and 3 to B, A, and uh, to, to uh, A, B, and G, essentially. Um, so so th those are the terms that they use. Yes, it's true. Within the Wi-Fi world, we rarely use the term Wi-Fi 1 or 2 or 3, but I'm just going by what, what the Wi-Fi Alliance uh, uses for their terminology, so... You know, whatever. I, I know some people 
kind of don't necessarily look at the Wi-Fi Alliance as the be-all, end-all of, uh, of, of you know, Wi-Fi terminology and, and the way the industry goes. But just, just to kind of keep it standard, to keep it so there's an easily accessible reference for, for everyone, I tend to use what the Wi-Fi uh, Alliance says. So... I know I'm only 38 minutes in and I still haven't gotten to the topic at hand. The point is uh, that, you know, so I read the Lee Badman blog. I'm like, yeah, great point. You know, that was something that I was thinking of blogging about was uh, the fact that I've noticed that uh, when when Apple didn't uh, use Wi-Fi 6 and, and Google for their home products, their Nest system, Google Nest, N-E-S-T, uh, they did not use Wi-Fi 6. In, in fact, Google smartphones, the Google Pixel, does not use Wi-Fi 6. You know, when I saw all this stuff, I'm, I'm like, oh, you know, maybe there's a Wi-Fi 6 client problem. I thought Lee covered that very well in the in the blog there that I posted the link to. Uh, but the compounded problem is, will Wi-Fi 6 devices actually use OFDMA? Will they even use sort of the signature technology? Or... Are they just going to revert to being Wi-Fi four and five devices? Are and and so that's that's kind of the issue there. And um, and and as I was thinking about that, I said, you know, to really understand the impact of this issue, you do have to understand a little bit about how Wi-Fi devices access the channel. So like. When my smartphone, when my laptop, when my desktop, you know, whatever device it is, connects to Wi-Fi and, and becomes part of a channel, um, if, if you don't understand how the Wi-Fi device accesses the channel, it, it may not, you know, it, it may not make that much of a difference to you. You may think to yourself, ah, who cares if a device is, is falling back to Wi-Fi 4, 5, or whatever it is. Uh, and so that's what I wanted to, to talk about today. And so, again, only uh, 40 minutes in, <laughs> getting to the uh, introduction here. So yeah, today is the 19th. This is Wi-Fi Streaming with Ben Miller. And today's topic is going to be channel access. As I posted on Twitter, a term that uh, I would say a lot of folks use for this is arbitration. But essentially what we're talking about here is how do Wi-Fi clients, access points, how do they share a Wi-Fi channel? That's that's kind of the key thing that I want to talk about in here. And just, you know, real quick with the shameless self-promotion stuff, uh, this is obviously the Ben underscore sniff Wi-Fi stream. Much appreciated it for anyone, uh, or, or I much appreciate it for anyone who uh, subscribes. If I get, uh, I forget exactly how many, how many the number needs to be, but if I get a, a few more subscribers, then I can kind of unlock other uh, features on Twitch. So hoping to kind of get there. Uh, I The other part of unlocking features is I need to do more streams. I need to do more than one stream a week. So that's something that I still haven't gotten to yet. I keep saying this every week, but I'm hoping to get back on on Friday to do another stream. We'll, we'll see if I can uh, make that happen. Uh, yeah, if you want to follow me on Twitter, at Ben Miller is the name there. If you want to get in contact with me via email, Ben underscore Miller at iCloud.com is the name there. And I do contract work. And look, you know, as a contractor, always looking for work. So if you uh, if you have a teaching engagement, some kind of technical writing, uh, I've written courseware, I've written study guides, I've written marketing material, uh, I've, uh, you know, taught classes, uh, taught vendor classes, taught vendor neutral classes. I've done, uh, uh, consulting work, you know, pre-installation, post-installation consulting work, always, uh, available. And, uh, well, I mean, I guess I shouldn't say I'm always available all the time, but always looking for, uh, for new work and, uh, try to make myself as available as possible. So, uh, so yeah, so let's talk about channel access. Let's talk about arbitration. And, you know, look, I, I know I've already put it up here on the screen a couple of times. Let me bring it back, this uh, Wireshark capture. Uh, this is a Wireshark capture that I made right before we started. Notice the name there. Hopefully you can see that at the top. Today's date, 2022-19. You can see the time, 10.02. So that's two minutes after I was supposed to be uh, starting the stream this week. Um, I did, uh, I did a little capture of, um, 
what was going on kind of uh, in my area. We can add the channel here. There's our channel. Channel's a little bit weird here in that, uh, what am I, what did I lose here? FCS status, there we go. We don't need the channel to be that large. Um, let's see what Wireshark is asking for here. We'll get to that later. Um, but yeah, so uh, you can see the channel there. Channel says uh, 5745 megahertz. 5745 megahertz is channel number uh, 149 with the 80 megahertz width. That's, uh, that's, that's what I was capturing with. And, uh, you know, for any of you who are Mac users, let me give this a little bit of space so you can see it over here. If you are a Mac user and you're ever wondering about the channel of your uh, access, whoops, that's right, I have to uh, move it back a little bit. Give me just a moment here. If you are ever wondering, you know, well, what channel is my uh, device on? If you hold down the Alt key or the Option key when you go to your Wi-Fi settings, it'll show you the channel. And obviously, you can see that my uh, computer right now is in error. Um, obviously, I am not in um, in any kind of... Uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, monitor mode or anything like that. Otherwise, I wouldn't have internet access, um, but uh, that's what it's currently showing. I suppose I, uh, I should just reboot the computer so that I can give you the correct information. But that's, that's, that's kind of how I got that was uh, channel 149. Um, and so what the reason why I wanted to show this, the reason why kind of in my eyes this Wireshark capture is interesting is... When you do a Wireshark capture, you're able to see everything that your device is seeing on the channel. So it's showing me everything that my, so, so I'm using a, um, an iMac for this. Everything that my iMac sees on its Wi-Fi channel is in this capture that you see here. So, so all of this stuff, this request to send, this clear to send, this data, this acknowledgement, and so on and so forth, what you see there is everything that's on the channel. And let me add a little um, time. Oh, it, got, it, has, uh, it has the time since the start of the capture. I suppose that's fine. So, and it, and it shows you, you know, there was a request to send. That was the first thing that was captured three, what would that be, microseconds later, a clear to send was captured, two microseconds after that, a quality of service data frame was captured, three microseconds after that, a, a block acknowledgement was captured, Th those numbers, to be honest with you, are a little bit on the fishy side. Um, but it shows you everything that was going across the Wi-Fi channel, and the reason why, in my view, this is important is because I feel like this is sort of a first step in understanding how Wi-Fi channel access works. The way Wi-Fi channel access works is <clears throat> there can only be one Wi-Fi frame, you know, Wi-Fi packet at a time traveling across the channel. So, you know, if I get back to my uh, little whiteboard setup here, So my wireless access point, I have the Google OnHub running right now. So this is my AP. Google OnHub is kind of a cylindrical shape here. I guess I shouldn't have included the stuff behind it. You know, if you want to imagine that as a cylinder, that's that's kind of what the Google OnHub looks like. So my access point is using channel number 149. It's using the 80 megahertz channel width. And so when I have my client device, I'm gonna draw it as a laptop even though I was using a desktop. When my client device here is connected to this access point, this client device is operating on channel number 149 with the 80 megahertz width. And the idea here is 
on channel 149 over the full 80 megahertz, you know, as, as we kind of talked about in uh, previous streams, channel 149 with 80 megahertz really means channels 149, 153, 161, and 165. So really what this is, is all four of those channels combined. Okay. So on all four of those channels combined, 149, 153, 161, and 165, and, and the reason why it's four is each one of these is 20 megahertz wide. You know, that's, that's kind of the idea there. So if we have an 80 megahertz channel, you kind of do the math on that. That's four 20s. So these are the four 20s that make up the 80 megahertz channel 149. And if you're wondering why isn't the channel number in the middle, you know, if, if you're using those four channels, why isn't the channel number in the middle? The reason is because the channel number that you're on, that channel number is used for 20 megahertz with whenever you have any kind of non-data traffic. Whenever you have any kind of management frames or you have any type of control frames, the management and the control frames will use channel number 149 with a 20 megahertz width. It is only the data frames that will use channel 149 with the 80 megahertz width that'll use all four of these channels. So getting back to kind of what I was mentioning there, my laptop here is connected to an access point that is on channel 149. The access point is using the 80 megahertz width. And so what that means is there can only be one frame at a time, at a time, across these four channels. Across channel 149, 153, 157, and, uh, sorry, I skipped must have had a complete brain fart there. This should have said 157. Apologies for that. So yeah, 149, 153, 157, and 161. Don't know what I was thinking there. And again, that's a 20 megahertz, 157. So yeah, so across those four channels, across 149, 153, 157, 161, there can only be one communication at a time. So for every little frame that you saw in that Wireshark capture, while that frame was going through the air and my computer was hearing that frame across the Wi-Fi channel, my computer was forced to stay quiet. The, the number one rule of Wi-Fi channel access, of, of arbitration, is that a client device or an access point will stay quiet if the channel is busy. Okay. Now, that does kind of lead us in another direction here. What exactly do I mean by a busy channel? How, how does my iMac or how does my access point define, well, a channel is busy? Unfortunately, the definition of a busy channel can vary by device. An Apple iPhone may define a busy channel one way. A Samsung Galaxy phone may define a busy channel another way. A MacBook may define a busy channel another way. There can be different definitions of what a busy channel is. So it, it's it's a little bit tricky for me to, you know, for me to be able to kind of sit here and say, okay, he, here are the parameters which are going to define a, a Wi-Fi channel as busy. Uh, but I'll do my best. I'll do my best to kind of summarize what that's going to mean. What we definitely know is that a Wi-Fi device will consider a channel to be busy if the Wi-Fi device hears high SNR 802.11 modulation and coding. That's what we definitely know. What we definitely know 
is if there are radio waves, so there are radio waves perhaps coming from the access point, or there are radio waves coming from something else that's on channel 149, or 153, or 157, or 161. If there are these radio waves, and those radio waves have a high enough signal-to-noise ratio, so meaning the signal of the radio wave is high enough above whatever level of noise my client device or my access point is hearing. If there's a high enough signal to noise ratio and if these little waves here are modulated and coded in an 802.11 technology. So in 802.11n or AC or AX or any of the other older 802.11 technologies. You know, 802.11a, b, g. If an 802.11 technology is used for the modulation encoding, and if the signal to noise ratio is high enough, we know for sure that every client device Every smartphone, every laptop, every access point, you know, not just client devices, but wireless access points as well. Every client device will consider the channel busy and will stay quiet. Once you get past that, you know, high signal to noise ratio with 802.11 modulation and coding, once you get past that, then things start to get a little bit tricky. It's like when I have a little bit of a lower signal to noise ratio. Some devices may consider the channel busy. Some devices may consider the channel clear. Let's say, for example, that the signal of these, you know, let's say here that, uh, for example, my noise floor is negative 95 dBm. Let's say the signal coming from these radio waves from this, you know, entity from this Wi-Fi device that's somewhere else, you know, that's not here in my office, let's say the signal of these radio waves as the radio waves hit the, hit my client device, hit my laptop, let's say the signal there is negative 88 dBm. Some devices may consider that a busy channel, some devices may not. Some devices may say, okay, well, what's the signal to noise ratio? Signal to noise ratio is very, very easy to calculate. Signal to noise ratio is just signal minus noise. That's assuming that your noise is in units of dBm and your signal is in units of dBm. I know sometimes there's a bit of confusion about the fact that this is a signal to noise ratio and you're using subtraction, but the reason why subtraction is a ratio is because decibels db are a logarithmic expression of power logarithms turn multiplication and division into addition and subtraction so if you're looking for the ratio of two logarithmic values it's always going to be subtraction it's not going to be signal divided by noise it's going to be signal minus noise okay so Calculate the signal to noise ratio, 88 or negative 88 minus negative 95. That's going to be an SNR of 7 decibels. And if you're curious about the whole M thing, dBm is used to indicate an absolute value. Like how strong is my transmit power? How high is my received signal strength? How high is the noise floor? Those are all absolute values. Decibels without the M, just dB, is uh, a, um, a, a measurement of a comparison of absolute values, like a change in power or a ratio of power. If you're comparing two values, then you use dB. So signal-to-noise ratios are in dB. Loss levels through walls, through windows, are in dB because you're comparing two numbers. How strong was the signal before it hit the wall? How strong is the signal after it hit the wall? So you use dB uh, for those numbers because you're comparing two numbers. So in any case, my signal-to-noise ratio here is 7 decibels. 
Some client devices, some access points may consider seven decibels high enough for it to be a uh, busy channel, for, for the channel to be considered busy. Some client devices and access points may not. Some client devices and access points may just look at signal strength alone. Cisco has this setting called RxSOP. I always forget what the SOP stands for. Gosh darn it all. Signal, ah. I'm forgetting exactly what it stands for. It's like received signal something. I, I think it's signal. I, I, might, I might even have that wrong, to be honest with you. Quick tea break. But Cisco devices have this RX SOP value, and if your signal, forget about the signal-to-noise ratio, but if your signal is below a certain level, your Cisco access points will simply ignore it. Uh, I know like a standard Cisco RX SOP value is negative 85 dBm. So for in this case, if this was a Cisco access point instead of my Mac laptop, my Mac laptop would not consider the channel busy because the signal that it received was below the RX SOP value. And then for some devices also, there can be variations on whether it's 802.11 standard or not. So some devices may say, well, if I hear anything, even if it's not 802.11 standard, if it's at a certain signal level, I'm going to shut up. I'm going to stay quiet. I'm going to assume the channel is busy. Some other devices may say, you know, it's got to be a really, 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 really high signal for it to be a non-802.11 radio wave, a non-802.11 modulated and coded radio wave to kind of keep my device quiet, okay? So the bottom line is the determination on whether a channel is busy and therefore the determination on whether a client device or an access point needs to stay quiet definitely does vary by client device or by access point. But then the key thing is once the channel is not busy, and I'm gonna put busy in quotes because again, different client devices, different access points may have different definitions of busy, then clients, then access points, enter arbitration. And arbitration in some ways is kind of a fancy way of asking who sends next. Who has the right? Which client device or which access point has the right to be able to transmit a wireless frame, a Wi-Fi frame next? Whose turn is it? to transmit the wireless frame next. Now, there's this whole complicated process, you know, maybe in a different, uh, maybe in a different stream, I'll, I'll kind of go through the, the complicated process in a little bit more detail, but essentially what's gonna happen here, I'll try to diagram it out the best I can. I have my access point here. I have one client device, let's say that's a laptop. I have another client device. Let's say that client device is a smartphone. So I have my client devices. I have my access point here. Let's say they're all using channel 149. Let's say channel 149 is with the 80, whoops, megahertz channel with, you know, just, just like uh, it was during the capture. So once the channel becomes quiet, once my devices all determine, okay, the channel is no longer busy, then clients are going to go through this arbitration process. And the arbitration process essentially kind of has two main steps in determining who's going to get to send data next. Kind of has two main steps. Step number one is kind of a standard quiet period. Every, every device that is ready to send data, you know, every device that's been waiting for the channel to no longer be busy, every device has this standard quiet period it's going to relate or it's going to uh, stay quiet for. 
And then after the standard quiet period, it then has a randomly selected quiet period. And it's only after those two things that we then get one client or one AP that has the right to send data, the right to transmit uh, something onto the wireless channel, something onto channel 149 over the 80 megahertz width. So that's, you know, that's kind of what happens. And, and look, again, I don't want to get too deep into the weeds here, but, you know, with this standard quiet period here, that can vary a little bit depending on the quality of service parameters that the different devices support. For example, if my iPhone here is doing FaceTime and if the FaceTime application is going to use kind of a higher priority to try to make it so that the, the voice or the video that I'm using as part of FaceTime uh, is a is a cons is consistent is an enjoyable application experience is a is a consistent application experience then I might have a shorter quiet period a shorter number one a shorter standard quiet period if this uh, you know laptop here if this laptop here let's say is uh, doing some type of calendar update some type of calendar sync. So there's nothing urgent with the data. If the calendar sync takes, you know, two seconds, two and a half seconds, something like that, it's it's not like it's going to make it so that people get mad at the calendar app and say, oh, this device sucks, this application sucks, it's not really working. So you can have a little bit of delay there. The calendar syncing may be lower priority, and so therefore, it might have a longer quiet period, a longer number one. So there's going to be that standard quiet period. It's like, okay, I'm doing FaceTime. So I have this short quiet period that I always have to wait after the channel stops being busy, after the channel becomes clear. Or my device is doing a calendar sync. So there's this longer time period that my device has to wait whenever the channel becomes clear, whenever the channel is no longer busy. And then for step two, it's randomly selected for the devices that are higher priority. What they get with the random selection is they get kind of a smaller sample, let's say, of random quiet times. Like the amount of random quiet time might vary somewhere between... 16 microseconds and uh or actually i guess theoretically it could be as short as zero microseconds and maybe only go up to 48 microseconds whereas a device that has the larger sample for period number two that's what we're talking about here is period number two is the randomly selected quiet period for the larger sample Maybe it could go anywhere between zero microseconds all the way up to 240 microseconds. So it's like higher priority, I'm choosing between zero and 48 microseconds. Lower priority, I'm choosing between zero and 240 microseconds. And so the lower priority device, there, there's, you know, it most likely just kind of based on, you know, the overall, you know, likelihood of something happening when you have a random selection the lower priority device is most likely going to have a longer quiet period. And what determines the right to transmit is whichever device had the shortest one and two. So, so the shortest combined standard quiet period and randomly selected quiet, quiet period, if you combine those two, Whichever client or whichever access point had the shortest randomly selected client, uh, quiet period or randomly selected uh, uh, standard quiet period or randomly selected quiet, quiet period, that device that had the shortest one is going to be the device that is allowed to send data next, that, that, that is given the right to use the channel next. Okay, And 
So here's how that relates to uh, OFDMA. Here's how that relates to, you know, whatever you want to call it. Wi-Fi 6 or 802.11ax. Here's how it relates to the OFDMA technology. The, the way it relates to that is that clients can do OFDM arbitration. And when clients do OFDM arbitration, essentially that allows the client to opt out of using OFDMA. Okay. With OFDMA, the access point wins arbitration then controls the channel. W uh, wins arbitration, then controls the channel. So with OFDMA, with this technology that's part of Wi-Fi 6, part of 802.11ax, the access point goes through this arbitration process. The access point wins arbitration, you know, has the shortest combined one and two. The shortest combined standard quiet period followed by random quiet period. So the access point wins that arbitration process, reserve, you know, has the right to transmit on the channel, and then the access point will essentially kind of send out indicators to, whoops, got to get back to where I was before. The access point will essentially send out information to client devices indicating when the client device has the right to transmit data back to the access point, when it has the right to uplink data back to the access point. That information will be sent by the access point to the client. We've talked about this in, in previous streams. Uh, these uh, the the right to uplink they're called uh, resource units or RUs resource units. So information about these resource units about these RUs will be transmitted to the client device, and then the access point will indicate okay here's when this set of RUs is going to be allowed to transmit. Okay, it's it's your turn to transmit. It's it's this other client's turn to transmit. The access point kind of takes control of the channel with OFDMA. And, and the idea is that client devices can kind of request certain service levels. Client devices can say, hey, you know, give me RUs that are going to be consistent with a calendar sync. Give me RUs that are going to be consistent with FaceTime. So the idea is that, that if everything works out well, you know, in a perfect world, the access point will get information from the client with the client saying, okay, here's the service level that I'm going to need for the applications that I'm running on this client device. The access point will kind of factor that in. The access point will make a decision. Okay, here's the RUs that I'm going to allocate to all of the client devices that are connected to my access point. And then the access point will say, okay, smartphone number one, here's the RUs. Here's the resource units you're going to use. Laptop number five, here's the resource, here's the resource units that you're going to use. But again, the Wi-Fi 6 standard, the 802.11ax standard, they do allow client devices to opt out of OFDMA and do standard OFDM arbitration. And that, to me, is the bigger question about Wi-Fi 6, even, even beyond the question of device support. Like, maybe I'll be proven wrong. I've, I've made a lot of predictions over the years in Wi-Fi some have been right, some have been wrong. And one of the predictions I would definitely make today is Wi-Fi 6 will eventually be widely supported. I'd be very surprised if I was talking to you, you know, in two or three years when the next refresh of Apple laptops or Apple desktops happen and Apple still isn't supporting Wi-Fi 6, still isn't supporting uh, 802.11ax. Same thing with stuff like the Google devices. My guess is it's just a price thing. My guess is that the chip makers who make Wi-Fi 6 chips wanted to sort of take advantage of the fact that Wi-Fi 6 is 
you know, it's it's a known thing out there in the media, out there in the technology world. And I think chip makers kind of went to Apple, went to Samsung, went to all these device manufacturers, went to Google, went to, you know, whatever, Motorola, Dell, Huawei, any of these uh, Wi-Fi client or access point companies. I think a lot of the chip mac- makers said, okay, here's a Wi-Fi 6 chip. You're paying a huge amount of money. You're paying double or you're paying triple what you're price would be if you did a Wi-Fi 5 chip. And I, I think just a lot of the device makers said, it's not worth it yet. I can still release smartphones, laptops, home automation devices, whatever today, have them use Wi-Fi 5 and my customers will still buy them. You know, the, the average person browsing on Amazon for Google Nest products or whatever, or wherever the person is shopping to, you know, control the lights or the thermo- the, the, the um uh, thermostat in their home, they they don't really care whether the Nest uh, you know system is using Wi-Fi six or Wi-Fi five. So let's not spend the extra money. Let's save some money for now, and then in two years, three years, five years, whatever the time period is when Wi-Fi six, when 802.11 AX chips come down in price, then we'll include it. So you know my perception at least is we're gonna get the Wi-Fi six. Um, you know, support from client devices. It's just we, uh, you know, the, the the bigger question is: Will we get devices that are doing a lot of opting out? Will we get? Will we see if we do Wi-Fi packet captures or if we use other Wi-Fi analysis tools? Will we see these Wi-Fi devices entering normal OFDM arbitration? winning the right to transmit data without using the OFDMA, without using resource units and all that stuff, and will it essentially be where Wi-Fi 6 is the same as Wi-Fi 5? Or I shouldn't say the same, but mostly the same. You know, Wi-Fi 6 without OFDMA is is really not much of an improvement compared to Wi-Fi 5. There are some, some little slight things at the margins there's you know a new modulation technology for short distance clear space links you know there there's some technologies that are in wi-fi 6 that are not part of wi-fi 5 but mostly wi-fi 6 is all about ofdma and if client devices opt out if client devices decide to enter this arbitration process on their own that could present a problem so that's you know that's that's kind of the 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 big concern that I have about that is, uh, you know, what's what's gonna what's gonna happen with that. So yeah, that that's that's the main thing that I wanted to to kind of cover today. Um, the one thing being kind of how client devices and how access points determine if a channel is busy or not busy. You know, all all of that. Wireshark stuff that I showed you before, all of those request send, clear to send, QoS data, block acknowledgement, all that stuff that you were seeing in Wireshark, that's all stuff that my computer was capturing on my wireless channel shortly before I started up this stream. So that's those are all things indic- making it so that my client device uh, thinks the channel is busy. You know, and, and I guess I can kind of put together a little list here. You know, how do I know if the channel is busy? You know, number one, if something can be captured. If if my Wi-Fi device is capturing something, my Wi-Fi device isn't sending anything. So anything I see in those packet captures, that's definitely an indication that so, the channel was busy. Number two, though, in addition to what my Wi-Fi device is able to capture, my Wi-Fi device also might consider the channel busy if there is a high noise level. The 802.11 standard says that the noise level would need to be higher than negative 62 dBm in the 802.11 standard. However, that does not necessarily mean that all Wi-Fi devices in the real world follow this negative 62 dBm standard. So if my client device hears uh, noise level of negative 65 of negative 70 dBm. It's always possible that my client device could consider the channel to be busy. So if I can capture it, definitely the channel is busy. If I hear very high noise level, definitely the channel is busy. Another thing 
that can make the channel be busy. Okay, sorry about that. Looks like I uh, had a brief little blip in the stream, but I don't think it crashed. Another thing that can uh, make the channel busy from the client's perspective or from the access point's perspective uh, is if there is data that is uncapturable. So this is uncapturable Wi-Fi frames. So, you know, this is captured Wi-Fi frames. Uncapturable Wi-Fi frames but Wi-Fi frames where the physical layer header is heard. That's another way that the Wi-Fi channel can be busy. We've talked about this kind of in earlier streams when I was talking about ghost frames. But the idea there is I have this access point, let's say again, channel 149 using 80 megahertz width. I have this client device here, you know, it's on channel 149 because it's connected to the access point. Let's say the access point transmits data to my client device. Let's say the access point uses a speed of 234 megabits per second, okay? So that's the data rate, that's the frame speed. You know, that's the MCS, that's the data rate that my uh, access point is using when transmitting to my client. As the radio waves for this 230, you know, so the modulated radio waves for this 234 megabits per second rate, as these modulated radio waves get further and further away, at some point there's going to be a, a range where those radio waves are no longer heard. So at some point there's you know we're going to we're going to reach this range where the 234 megabit per second radio waves can no longer be heard. But that doesn't mean that the radio waves just magically stop propagating through the air. The radio waves still can keep on propagating through the air and it's important to note that the physical layer header in 802.11 is always at the six megabit per second data rate. At the six megabit per second MCS, or if you want to call it a data rate. The lower the data rate, the further away the frame can be demodulated. The lower the data rate, the lower the signal to noise ratio required for demodulation. And so, there could be a Wi-Fi device that's way the heck out here, cannot capture the full Wi-Fi frame, okay? It's not a capturable Wi-Fi frame, right? Because the Wi-Fi frame was at 234 megabits per second. For the Wi-Fi frame to be able to show up in Wireshark, I have to be able to capture the full frame. So I'm not gonna be able to capture the full Wi-Fi frame, but my client device can hear six megabits per second just fine, so my client device hears the physical layer header, and that may cause my client device to think, oh, the channel's busy. I heard the physical layer header. We talked about this in a previous stream. The physical layer header contains something called the length field, and the length field indicates how long client devices and access points are supposed to stay quiet to allow the rest of the frame, to allow the data part or, or the control part or the management part, allow the rest of the frame, you know, the 234 megabit per second part of the frame, how long to stay quiet to allow that full part of the frame to, to, to be sent. So that's one big thing that I kind of wanted to mention today. You know, here's how my devices determine whether the channel is busy. I'm either hearing a Wi-Fi frame, I'm hearing a huge amount of noise, or I heard the physical layer header. Even if I couldn't hear the full frame, I heard the physical layer header. And then once the channel is busy, is, is no longer busy, kind of talked about this earlier, then 
my client devices go through those quiet periods. My client devices and my access points say, okay, the channel's no longer busy. Let me wait this standard quiet period. Let me go through this randomly selected quiet period. And then once I finish the quiet periods, one client will get the right to transmit. Um, to get a little bit more technical, that right to transmit, that is called a TXOP or transmit opportunity. Transmit opportunity might just be one frame of data. That that's that's how it commonly is in older OFDM or or even some of the newer OFDM, even the 802.11n or AC OFDM, they're just going to be one frame transmitted. But winning the right to transmit, winning the TX opportunity also might mean multiple frames. In OFDMA, winning the transmit opportunity allows the access point to reserve the channel for several frames to allow that kind of to facilitate that communication back and forth to allow clients to request their RUs or be told which RUs they're going to receive. Uh, so there, there might be multiple frames that are part of each transmit opportunity. Okay, so that, and, and that part's going to vary with clients. And you know, the, these are things that, uh, you know, I want to go into in future streams. In future streams, I, I want to talk a little bit about kind of what options there are when a client wins a transmit opportunity or what the access point does when it wins a transmit opportunity. That's what I want to go through in future streams. Uh, last part here. Uh, for those of you that might be more into kind of the super technical side of things, I want to go through you know, the super technical side of things for how exactly the quiet periods work. Put some names on those things. So what this is gonna be is this is gonna be a, a little arbitration example. So admittedly, this is gonna be a little bit on the technical side or kind of very on the technical side, but that's the last thing I wanted to go through here. For those of you that are interested in the more technical side of things, here's a little arbitration example. And so in my example, we're going to have a smartphone and the smartphone is going to be doing FaceTime and FaceTime is going to be part or is going to be classified as video. There are four quality of service classifications in Wi-Fi. The highest priority is voice. Second priority is video. Third priority is best effort. And lowest priority is background. So FaceTime for the uh, smartphone, for the iPhone. Then I have my little laptop here. Let's say I'm doing web surfing. And let's say my web surfing will be categorized as best effort. Okay. So here's how the uh, arbitration example works. We're going to use a timeline going from left to right. And a key thing to understand about 802.11 channel access, 802.11 arbitration, Wi-Fi channel access, Wi-Fi arbitration. Every device is kind of an island unto itself. Every access point, every client device, it's doing its own thing. It's, it's listening to the channel to determine if the channel is clear. It's trying to transmit on, on its own. Now, again, OFDMA changes that. OFDMA makes it so that access points can tell clients when to wake up, when to transmit, when to be ready to receive. But if you're not using OFDMA, and, and again, even a Wi-Fi 6 device has the option of opting out of OFDMA. Again, you know, that that's kind of a big part of you know what? Why I'm going through arbitration is just because of the fact that uh, because of the fact that Wi-Fi six devices have the option to opt out of OFDMA. Sorry about that. Um, so every device is kind of an island unto itself. So essentially, I'm doing three timelines. Here's the timeline for my little smartphone. Here's the timeline for my access point. Here's the timeline for my laptop. And again, the smartphone is doing video category. The laptop is doing best effort category. 
uh, for, for the quality of service categories here. And let's say my access point, you know, uh, is, um, you know, doesn't really have anything to send. Let's say the access point is, is just quiet for, for the moment. So, so here's how this whole thing uh, is going to work. At some point, everybody at the same time, ideally everybody at the same time, is going to believe that the channel is no longer busy. You know, my access point is on channel 149 using the 80 megahertz channel width. At some point, my iPhone, my access point, my laptop, they're going to say, okay, channel number 149 with the 80 megahertz width is no longer busy. It is now a quiet channel. When the channel becomes quiet, the first step in arbitration is something called the arbitration interframe space, or AIFS. The AIFS is the standard quiet time. So going back here, you may remember from before, talked about the whole channel access. I said there are two steps for arbitration. Step number one, a standard quiet period. Step number two, a randomly selected quiet period. Then one Kleiner access point has the right to transmit. So we are doing the standard quiet period. The standard quiet period is the AIFS, the arbitration interframe space. And again, we're saying with the access point, the access point has no frames ready to send ready to transmit. So the access point is essentially just staying quiet here. Because of the fact that my smartphone is using video, which is higher priority than best effort, the amount of time my smartphone has to stay quiet for the interframe space is shorter than the amount of time my laptop has to stay quiet for the interframe space. So if we, you know, our, our trying to look at this on the timeline, the iPhone stays quiet for less of the standard quiet period, less of the interframe space, less of the arbitration interframe space because of the fact that the application being run by the smartphone is a video application, is FaceTime rather than a uh, best effort, rather than a web surfing application. So we have the, uh, uh, we have the, quiet time that's a standard quiet time. Then after that, we get into the random quiet time. The random quiet time is called the random back off. So the standard quiet time is the interframe space. Typically, it will be an arbitration interframe space. There are some exceptions to that. For example, if the client device just heard a corrupted frame, then the client device may stay quiet for what's called the extended interframe space. So, so there are uh, exceptions to the arbitration interframe space, but there will definitely be some interframe space, some IFS. And then the client will go into this randomly selected quiet period. What the random back off is, is the random back off is a countdown of quiet periods, of stand of static quiet periods. These quiet periods are called slot times. Slot times. Slot time depends, it varies by which standard you're using. If I remember correctly, in the five gigahertz band, the standard slot time is 16 microseconds. I might be a little bit off by that. I'm, uh, I want to say it's 16, but I might be off. If, if anyone uh, that's watching along live uh, remembers what the standard slot time is for 5 gigahertz, feel free to uh, uh, chime in in the chat area. You know, it's possible 9 in 5 gigahertz, so 9 microseconds in 5 gigahertz. So, so I must have had it flipped. So, uh, yeah, I, I was thinking 9 microseconds in 5 gigahertz, and uh, sorry, nine microseconds in 2.4 gigahertz and 16 microseconds in five gigahertz. So uh, maybe I had those flipped. It's possibly um, 16. Oh, gotcha. That's, that's, thank you, German. Yeah. 
There we go. That's what I was thinking of. So the short... Well, that doesn't make sense, though. Or Oh, no. Yeah, that, that does make sense. I'm sorry. Yeah. So the short inner frame space is the 16 microseconds. Sorry. I was thinking of the fact uh, of... Um, I, I wasn't thinking of the short inner frame space. Um, I was thinking of uh, the DIFS there when I said it didn't make sense. Uh, but yeah, okay, so there we go. Thank you, German. Much appreciated. So yeah, nine microseconds slot time, short inner frame space was what I was thinking of with 16 microseconds. So uh, it ran to back off a little countdown of these uh, quiet times, of these uh, slot times, as they are called in the 802.11 standard. If a device is video, the device can choose anywhere between zero and seven slot times. If a device is best effort, it can choose anywhere between zero and 15 slot times. And there's a mathematical equation that uh, determines kind of the latter number, the higher number. The higher number here, that higher number, that number is called the contention window or CW. That's called the contention window or CW. Just like the TV network that shows a bunch of superhero shows here in uh, the United States, the CW. The contention window or CW is the maximum number of slot times that a client device or that an access point can choose when the client or access point is participating in arbitration. And the CW is equal to 2 to the power of X minus 1. And so ba basically the way this works is if you are using the video or if an application is using the video quality of service level, the video priority level, the X value for video is equal to three. The X value for best effort is equal to four. And then if there's collisions, the X values go up. So then the maximum random back off goes up. You know, the contention window goes up. That's that's a whole separate thing. I don't, I don't want to get too much into collisions right now. But but that's what happens is uh, the X value increases every time there's a collision. Every time a client device or an access point has to resend data, the client device or the access point raises its X value when going through arbitration and, and before sending that data. So... Uh, Choosing a time between 0 and 7, let's say my uh, client device here, my uh, iPhone chooses a 5, choosing a random time between 0 and 9. Let's say my uh, uh, laptop here chooses an 8. And then uh, they just start counting down. First one to hit 0 gets, gets, uh, a, gets a, a transmit opportunity. So that's the basic deal here is first client or AP to hit zero slot times wins a TX op. Okay, that's the, the basic deal there. First client or access point to hit zero slot times wins the TX op. So my client here is gonna count down to four. When my client counts down to four, then it's going to be matched up. My iPhone is going to be matched up with the laptop. So, so basically, video devices get a one slot head start compared to best, best effort devices. The AIFS for video is one slot shorter than the AIFS for, um, uh, for, for a best effort. And yeah, and uh, German has the equation there for those who are uh, curious about the equations. Count down to three. That's going to be a seven. Again, these are going to match up. Count down to two. That's going to be a six. Count down to one. That's going to be a five. And then here we go. Count down to zero. My laptop is still at four. Now my client has won the TX app. Now my client is going to transmit some type of Wi-Fi frame, some type of 802.11 frame. Okay, so that's how my client, that, that's what my client device is going to do. When that 802.11 frame gets transmitted, at that moment, 
that's going to cause my other devices on the channel to then think that the channel is busy. Now there's a busy channel again from this client's perspective. This client does get to hold its slot time number. It does get to start counting at four the next time the channel becomes clear. So the my laptop here that's doing the web surfing, that's doing best effort, that client device will be able to just start counting down from four the next time it enters a random back off. Uh, but for now, that client device uh, believes that the channel is busy. And so there you go. Now there will be some type of 802.11 frame. Now, here, here's where things broaden out a little bit, and I, I don't want to get too deep into it in, in this particular stream, but at some point in the future, I'll, I'll kind of flesh this out a little bit. You know, the client that wins the TX opportunity here, so this right here, this is the uh, TX op. That's winning the TX opportunity. So winning the TX op, winning the uh, transmit opportunity, if it's an access point, it could go into using OFDMA. Uh, if it's using regular OFDM, it might go straight into sending a data frame. Uh, it might go through the request to send, clear to send protocol, then send data. Um, it might send a management or a control frame, you know, something that's not data, non-data. Um, or uh, it, it may uh, just send CTS to self followed by data, then data. Any of these are a possibility. Whoops. Meant to do that in green to differentiate it a little bit. Any of those things could happen when something wins its transmit opportunity, wins its right to send. But again, everything else on the channel thinks that the channel is busy. Everything else on the channel, all the other access points, all the other clients, anything that can hear the radio waves is going to stay quiet because it thinks the channel is busy because that client or that access point that's hearing these radio waves thinks that the uh, channel is busy. And so again, you know, the, the positive part of Wi-Fi 6 is if stuff is using OFDMA, the access point wins its transmit opportunity. The access point sends out, it, it, you know, can get information from client devices with clients requesting RUs the clients think are necessary to run the client applications. The access point can allocate RUs, allocate resource units to the clients to try to make sure the client's alloc uh, applications can run. Client devices can go to sleep and save battery life. N not the whole client going to sleep, just the Wi-Fi radio. The Wi-Fi radio of clients can go to sleep to save battery life, to you know, e extend the battery life of client devices. So all, all sorts of cool stuff can happen with OFDMA. It's just the question I have is, will clients stick with OFDMA? Even the clients that are Wi-Fi 6, you know, the Lee Badman... You know, I'll put that up here. Uh, um, you know, this is the uh, web address for that blog that I was mentioning earlier on in the stream. The Lee Bladman blog makes a great point about, you know, and you can see it right there, manage your Wi-Fi 6 expectations. There's not a ton of client devices that are using Wi-Fi 6. But even if you have Wi-Fi 6 clients, even if you have Wi-Fi 6 access points, the question then becomes, will clients opt out? Will clients essentially decide, you know what, I'm going to just go into arbitration myself. I'm going to go into regular old OFDM arbitration. I'm going to go through, you know, this whole process here. Wait till the channel is quiet. Go through the AIFS, go through the random back off. Win a TX op and start sending frames, you know, either data or request send, clear to send or management or control or clear to send itself, whatever it is. You know, you, you might have clients that are kind of opting out of OFDMA and then potentially causing issues. Um, I, I, I don't know that I should say causing issues, but what I would say is making it so that Wi-Fi 6 doesn't reach the potential that many of us hope that it'll reach. That's, that's what I kind of mean by that is 
you may have cases where client devices aren't getting big, big benefits from the upgrade to Wi-Fi 6 because even though the client is capable of OFDMA, the client, because of the applications the client device is running, keeps on opting out and keeps on going back into arbitration and keeps on doing all of this, you know, non OFDMA, uh, OFDMA stuff. This is the, you know, 802, 802.11N or AC OFDM stuff. That's, that's what the bottom four are there. You know, and again, that's Wi-Fi 4, Wi-Fi 5. You may have client devices that are doing that type of stuff. So, so yeah, that's, that's kind of the key there. And look, you know, I, I know kind of for today's stream, I'm, I'm sort of focused on some very technical topics, focused on the arbitration side of things. But, you know, hopefully what I talked about today also can relate to just other general Wi-Fi tests and activities, design and troubleshooting of Wi-Fi networks. Because, you know, hopefully not only with the arbitration example kind of, uh, um, you you know, perhaps helping out with... uh, your design, understanding, you know, kind of how devices share with one another, understanding troubleshooting. If you see client devices or access points on the same channel and and understanding how they share the channel via arbitration, but hopefully also with just understanding how a client device or how an access point perceives that the channel is busy. Just understanding, you know, if you go into a certain area and you have cases where the Wi-Fi is not working optimally, either you know, users have complained about the Wi-Fi or in your testing you're concerned about it or if you're anticipating some type of big event and you want to prepare the Wi-Fi so that the Wi-Fi doesn't fail during uh, your big event. You know, being aware of this type of stuff, okay, here are all the things that can make the channel look busy. Well, of course, if there's an actual frame on the channel, great. You know, we all understand that. But going beyond that, if there's noise, if there's uncapturable Wi-Fi frames, those things can also eat up channel time, can also make the uh, Wi-Fi channel look busy. And they're things that you may want to take into account. So yeah, hopefully uh, this was a useful thing. I was hoping to go a little bit more into the Wireshark. You know, when I look at Wireshark, it's just the times are so weird here. I mean, it's just, I don't know. It's not particularly believable to me that you have this data frame. I mean, is that? It, yeah, it's just odd. I have this data frame and it's saying 209, 926 microseconds, right? So, you know, the 209 would be milliseconds, 209 milliseconds, 200,009 microseconds. You know, microsecond is one one millionth of a second. So then it's saying three microseconds later, an acknowledgement was heard. To me, that is not plausible. To me, what that's saying is my la- my desktop here was capturing. It captured the frame, but then by the time it could process the frame into Wireshark, something got a little bit delayed there to make it look like there was only this three microsecond difference. Let's go a little bit further. That was at the beginning of the capture, so maybe that's the reason. Yeah, th- th- this is a lot more believable to me. This is definitely a lot more believable. So it's like, this This is coming from, I, I recognize this MAC address, this Apple MAC address, that's my laptop. You know, I might, I might as well put up the source to go along with the destination. So yeah, so here's this request to send this this uh, Apple 6825. I believe that's my laptop. That might be my iPad, actually. I'm checking my iPad right now. If you ever uh, are curious what the... Um, I, I know I've showed this already in previous streams, but for any of you that may not have seen in the previous streams, um, if you ever want to take a look at what the Mac address is of an Apple iOS device. You can just go to settings, general about, and uh, I'll bring that up right now. So here's a look at my beautiful iPhone. Just got my iPhone replaced. I don't use cases for my iPhone. 
I just like the look of a clean iPhone and then also the bulk factor. The iPhone can get a little bit bulky in my pocket if I put a case on it. So I dropped my phone, but I have, I have Apple Care, so uh, you know, hundred bucks to to get a new phone, basically. Um, but yeah, so if you go into settings, you can hopefully see settings there. And any iPhone, it's the same thing. You go to settings, you go to general, and then you see it up at the top there. Whoops, up at the top there, about. And there we go. Wi-Fi address. Can see I just tapped on it. So yeah, that's that's my uh, that's my iPhone's address. So this must have been my laptop. What you're seeing in Wireshark must have been my laptop. And uh, yeah, German mentioning an arbitration uh, white paper. Yeah, definitely the CWNP program has a lot of good uh, arbitration stuff. Oh, the old uh, Marcus Burton white paper. I see. Yeah, yeah, fantastic uh, white paper. Yeah, maybe someday I'll, I'll just dedicate the, uh, you know, the talk to arbitration. To, so the thing about that white paper that, you know, and look, I don't want to hate. I do think it's a very good white paper. I encourage you all to click the link German put in there. In fact, let me copy and paste that link. So that way, if you're if, if you're not watching this live, you'll still have the ability to click the link or, or to at least find the link. Give me just a moment to... Uh, to post that here. Sorry, it's taken a minute here, but here's here's the uh, link that German posted for those of you that may not be watching live, that may be watching a uh, um, a recording of this either on Twitch or on YouTube. But yeah, that second one down there, that's the key one. That's that's the one that, uh, whoops, German was nice enough to post here. So yeah, this one right here. So yeah, if you go to that one, you can you can uh, look at a great white paper in uh, ar on arbitration. And again, I do recommend the, the white paper strongly. I think it's a very, very good white paper. The The one nitpick I have is, is there's like a couple things that get overlooked a little bit. So number one is for arbitration to happen, the client device has, or, or the access point for that matter, has to be ready to get a TX op. So if you have an environment that has, you know, 200 client devices all connected to one access point, that environment can still work very well. You can still have happy users doing whatever it is they need to do, you know, uploading Instagram pictures, um, you know, sending iMessages or WhatsApp messages, things of that nature. You can still have, you can have 200 client devices all connected to one access point and have those devices working fine even though this arbitration, you know, exists the way it does. And so, so the reason why I'm saying that is I've run into the case in, in, a, in a couple scenarios where I'm, I'm talking with someone about design, either a consulting project. Also, I ran into this a couple times back in the days when I was teaching Wi-Fi. And people say, well, you know, we, uh, yeah, you know, I've heard about arbitration or I've learned about arbitration. And that's why we try to, design our Wi-Fi so that we have no more than 40 clients connected to an access point at any given time. No more than 50 clients, No, you know, whatever the number is that uh, people choose. And it's, it's I, in my view, it's kind of not really the proper way to look at it because you may have 200 clients that are all connected to the same access point, but at any given microsecond, for a client to be part of arbitration, it has to be ready to send something. You know, even even if you're on what ostensibly is a higher bandwidth application, even if you're doing like video conferencing, you're still going to see significant delays between the data packets. You know, even if there's no arbitration, there's no competition for use of the wireless channel, 
It's just the amount of time it takes for the device to be ready to send data can be somewhat significant. And so that's one thing that I thought was maybe a little bit missing from that arbitration white, white paper is the context of, look, yes, this is how arbitration works. Yes, if you get too many devices participating in arbitration at once, it can make your wireless channel a bit of a mess. But I think what that paper overlooked a little bit is in reality, you don't get a ton of devices. Even if you have 200 devices connected, you may only have 10 at any given moment that are actually participating in arbitration at the same microsecond because, you know, the other devices are, are not. The other devices are running some application that don't require the device to send data at that, at that specific microsecond that you're talking about that arbitration is happening. So that's one part of it. And then the second part is kind of what I went over earlier on in this stream is how does a given client or given access point actually perceive whether the channel is busy? You know, every client, every access point is going to have a slightly different arbitration experience because every client and every access point can hear different things. And so that's something that I thought maybe got a little bit overlooked in that arbitration white paper there, you know, because... An AP that's mounted to the ceiling, a client that's down at someone's desk, those two things are hearing slightly different things. And so their arbitration experiences might be slightly different in terms of, you know, when they stay quiet, when they think the channel's busy, et cetera, et cetera. And so that, uh, um, yeah, that's that's another thing that maybe gets a little bit uh, overlooked there. Give me just a moment. I just got an incoming call that I wasn't expecting. I want to make sure this isn't urgent Check my uh, messages here real quickly. Ah, there we go. Um, so yeah, so actually I just got a call saying I have to wrap it up. Um, um, so yeah, so but so yeah, that that that's kind of what I wanted to mention there about the old um, about the arbitration thing. But yeah, getting getting back real quick, I, I do want to just finish this up before I wrap it up and, and kind of address that uh, call that just came in. But yeah, you'll you'll notice here, you know, if you look at it, whatever that is, 70 microseconds after the request to send comes the clear to send. Another 70, well, now this is getting suspicious. Another 70 microseconds later comes data. And now I'm actually starting to wonder, uh, is that correct? That it, it, the fact that it's exactly 70 microseconds definitely makes me worry a little bit uh, as I see these times here. But, but yeah, the point is, sorry, just a moment. <clears throat> yeah, you can, you can kind of hopefully see by looking at the time column, you can see the differences in time as, as these devices, uh, you know, are... Uh, are, are sending data or are receiving data that that may be indicative of some amount of arbitration happening in the background of uh, something occurring in the background. Um, we'll look at the uh, size of these packets. So yeah, little bit suspicious here. A 45 byte frame followed by exactly 70 seconds, a 39 byte frame exactly 70 seconds. 1606, 71 seconds, 71 seconds, 69 seconds. Definitely some fishy stuff going on. Might be that these times are not 100% accurate as far as when the frame actually went off the uh, channel. Um, but yeah, so... Uh, so yeah, so yeah, so the the point is, you know, when when if my lap, so when I did this capture, my laptop was in monitor mode, my laptop was not active on the channel. If my laptop were to get active on the channel, my my laptop's just going to fit itself in there. You know, at the end of this stream of data, you can kind of see this stream of data here is all coming from my laptop. Request to send, clear to send. Here's another little thing I didn't really address in arbitration, but this duration value in the header is indicating how much time the transmit opportunity is for. So it's like my laptop, one arbitration. So my laptop gets a transmit opportunity. My laptop sends this request to send. And my laptop says there's going to be 330 microseconds 
that I'm going to need to be able to send data. So you can kind of do the math there, 330 microseconds, that should bump this up to about, in terms of the time, if you look at the time that's on that request to send, 338, that, that should bump this up to whatever that is, you know, 8.388 to something. So 330 microseconds after the clear to send, 300 or 286 microseconds. So apparently there was about a 54 microsecond uh, time period that uh, elapsed between the end of the request to send and the end of the clear to send. And then in the first data frame, 48 microseconds at the end of that data frame. And the 48 microseconds appears to be for a block acknowledgement and actually is this a retransmission of the same frame over and over again? We can always check if there's a retransmission by looking at... Uh, oh, I thought I had uh, the retry flag already up here. I guess I don't. Yeah, so this is a uh, retransmitted frame. Let's Let's add a little column for the retransmission here. pretty wide so yeah whoops now I'm I lost my place here it was down around eight seconds look at this and I'm doing this all the way at the end too really really bad etiquette on my part to do this uh, stuff all the way at the end of a stream but yeah, I, I, I kind of lost my place there. But yeah, I got the request to send uh, probably the same amount of time, probably the 330. Oh no, 194. So request to send of 194, probably due to the fact that there's fewer frames that are going to be coming. Clear to send is going to be lower as well, 150. Uh, so from 194 to 150, oh, sorry, 44 second difference, not, uh, not 54 seconds. So 44 microsecond difference there and then the data that follows you see the 48 you see the 48 it looks like these are uh retransmissions so the idea was hopefully this first one will be successful nope it wasn't successful i'm gonna try it again and then we have this block acknowledgement this block acknowledgement most likely is making this frame successful we can always look at the sequence number. This is sequence number 2189. Let's see if the block acknowledgement covers 2189. So the starting sequence control was 2126. I want to say it would be 63 um, frames that would be covered there. Now I'm kind of forgetting uh, but I think that would cover it. 2126 to 2189, that should cover, uh, that at least should cover 2188. That at least would cover 2188. And then, yeah, starts all, uh, starts all over again with 2190. So yeah, it looks like 2189 was successful, but then 2190 did not get its block acknowledgement there. And yeah, now I'm going into stuff that I didn't really cover enough here. I didn't really cover like the whole uh, block acknowledgement thing and acknowledgement thing. Um, I briefly talked about request to send, clear to send. But if you're curious kind of what's happening here. So sequence number 2189, you can see it there. SN 2189, SN 2188. This block acknowledgement is saying I'm starting at sequence number 2126. And since the bitmap is all Fs, it's saying the next 63 frames after 2126 are also acknowledged. So anything numbered 2126 or 2189 is good, is acknowledged. So that's something, notice the source on that block acknowledgement is TP-Link. TP-Link is my access point. So now my client device says, okay, great. Uh, that's been acknowledged and and... Here, in fact, uh, the access point sends some data to my client device. You can see there TP-Link is the source. 
Got some QoS data, totally different sequence, number sequence, number 878, 879, totally out of order. My at my my uh, client device acknowledges, does its little block acknowledgement. There you go, starting sequence control, 8788. The block acknowledgement bitmap says, I'm only gonna acknowledge 8788 and 8789. Oh, sorry, uh, 878 and 879. Notice 880 is missing. So 880 is not acknowledged. 878 and 879 are acknowledged. In this block acknowledgement, 880 is not acknowledged going all the way to, you know, 63 frames ahead. 878 was the first one. 63 frames in front of that would be 941. So going all the way up to 941, that stuff is all not acknowledged. The only ones that are being acknowledged are 878 and 879, starting with 880, not acknowledged. So then kind of the next sequence, my iPhone wins arbitration, or sorry, not my iPhone, my uh, laptop, my Apple laptop wins arbitration. Got a little request to send there. Uh, the request to send saying, hey, you know, keep the channel quiet for at least 330 microseconds. And maybe this is why things are failing. Maybe 330 microseconds isn't enough time. You add 330 on, you look at the time here. We might even be able to do a delta time, I think. Let me do my uh, column preferences. I think there's like a delta time I can add. Where's my list of columns here? Man, I thought... Yeah, there we go. Delta time. That's what I want. So we want to add a column. Why am I not seeing? There's my columns. New column. There we go. Sorry about that, everybody. Delta time. do the delta time you know i should show you you all this uh how this looks since some of you may be interested in wireshark and how wireshark works i got to do more stuff with wireshark on these streams i i got a note from uh my uh friend who called me that uh it's not urgent that i can get in touch with him in about uh 15 minutes so yeah, um, so this screen you're seeing, this uh, Wireshark Preferences screen, I got to that Wireshark Preferences screen by right-clicking on, uh, maybe you can see it here, by right-clicking, I guess maybe you can't see my right-clicks, but uh, by going to the Column Preferences, you can go to just Wireshark Preferences and, and uh, go to the Column Preferences. Here, I'll show you getting to Wireshark preferences. So yeah, there's Wireshark. Go up to preferences. This might be an easier way to do it. There's the columns. And uh, I can add in a little delta time column. I guess I did not add it in before. Click the little plus, it adds a column at the bottom. Double click, name this delta time. And there is a delta time option here where it says number. Go up to delta time. Do an OK. Got to scroll a little bit. Where are you? There it is. Okay, there I can sort of see delta time. There we go. So there's my delta time. The, the big difference between delta time and time is delta time shows the time between the current frame and the previous frame. 
So that's, that's the big difference there. So now I can get rid of time. See channel a little bit better. There we go. So yeah, now I'll bring this back the way it was before so you can see it a little bit easier. Okay, sorry about that. But yeah, uh, so now I can see some of the delta times here. I go back down to where I was before. I think it was right around here. This might have been it. So no, yeah, now I can kind of see some of the delta times. Yeah, 21, 89, 878, 879. Those ones were successful. But then I see here, so request to send... I say I'm going to request 330 microseconds, and if I add that up, you know, here's 70 microseconds, here's another 64, here's another 64, here's another 64, here's another 69. It's going to be somewhere right around there that I'm done with my 330 that I originally had. Or, or if you even look at the clear descend with 286 microseconds, that's not even going to cover five of these. You know, if you add up 64 plus 64, I'm just looking at the delta time column here. When you add up those uh, times, you know, 64 plus 64 plus 64 plus 79 plus 71, I'm already beyond that uh, 200 and, uh, what was it, 286 microseconds. So there's all these frames, 2190 all the way through 2200 that are sent by my laptop. Notice they're all Apple as the source. You know, hopefully you, you kind of see that they're all Apple as the source over on the left. And uh, there's no block acknowledgement at the end of them. So now my laptop says, OK, let me try this again. Request to send again. Same duration. Clear to send again. Same duration. I'm going to try to resend the exact same frame. 2190 all the way through 2200. And it looks like, again, it didn't work. So my laptop says, let me try it again. Request to send again. If we, uh, I don't know if I have the data rates here, but sometimes what happens is devices will lower their data rate after these failures. So notice here, the rate is 702, 702 megabits per second, 702 megabits per second. Sometimes clients will lower their rate if they keep getting these failures. So my laptop tries it again. Request to send, clear to send, sends data starting with 2190, fails again. Ah, now finally my laptop decides I'm going to lower my data rate to 526. Hopefully you see that there over on the right, data rate. Lowers the data rate to 526. Lo and behold, block acknowledgement. So now successful data communication. And if I bet you if we look at this block acknowledgement, actually I'm wrong. Uh, I was going to say, I bet you if we look at this block acknowledgement, it's going to be 2190 uh, all the way up to 2200. But you know what? Maybe it's just the format of the block acknowledgement. Now that I'm looking at it, it's 2137 with an all F bitmap. So that does go up to 2200. If you do 2137 plus 63, because there's a total of 64 frames that can be acknowledged with one block acknowledgement, that is, in, that is going up to 2200. 2137 plus 63 would be 2200. So yes, all of these are acknowledged. So my Apple laptop is a stubborn mofo. Look at this thing. But you know what happened probably is because the access point sent at 702. This is why you don't want high transmit power on your access points. The darn Google access point. That's why I'm using is Google. That's probably what's happening here is Google is probably using too high of a transmit power. Google says, I got a high transmit power. I'm going to use 702. Look where it says data rate over towards the right. 702, 702 megabits per second. Google sends the 702. Even though Google just heard data from my laptop at 526 at a lower rate that was successful. The block acknowledgement was successful. So Google sends at 702. 
My laptop block acknowledges at 24. Notice Apple is the source. If you look on the left, block acknowledgement at 24. And my laptop thinks, oh, Google just, Google OnHub just sent it 702. I'm going to try 702. No block acknowledgement. Let me try 702 again. No block acknowledgement. Let me try 702 again. No block acknowledgement. Let me try 526. Block acknowledgement. Now the access point sends at 702. You can see here destination is my laptop. Data at 702. Acknowledge. Let's see what my dumb laptop does now. Request to send. 330. Clear to send. 286. My laptop tries to do 585. For any of you that are here with me live, take a guess. I, I don't even know the answer to this. But let's take a guess. Will 585 megabit per second data from my laptop be successful? Yes or no? I'm very curious about this. I don't know the answer. This is not a rigged exam. So 2201, next sequence number. We know that 702 failed. We knew that 526.6 was successful. I'm going to guess that the answer is no, it will not fail. Uh, yes, it will be successful is, is what I should be saying there. Let's check. Oh, correct answer. So we see the block acknowledgement. So last frame sent, 2211. Block acknowledgement says it starts at 2148. 2148 plus 63 is 2211. So all of these were acknowledged correctly. All right. I got to run, everybody. Uh, the person I was supposed to uh, meet with said 1220 Pacific and it is 1214 and they just gave me the notice that I got to meet with them immediately. Thank you for joining as always. Uh, hopefully you got something good out of it. Um, I enjoyed it as always. I will see you next week, not conflicting with WLPC. For those of you that you know are at WLPC watching this on archive, apologies. You know I just wanted to keep the uh, Wednesday tradition going. Um, and I will uh, see you all down the road. Have a good rest of the week. Those of you that are at WLPC, enjoy WLPC. And uh, maybe see you next uh, later this week. I'm going to possibly try to do another stream later this week. Have a good one, everyone.